we're really excited about our panel today uh, because we have a quite broad uh, diversity of uh, panelists uh, from uh, different aspects of society who are working on COVID-19. So really excited to, to get started in a few more moments. For those of you who just joined, uh, just I'll repeat myself again. You probably will hear me repeating this a few times, but uh, we'll be starting in a few more minutes as we wait for people to get on Zoom. And um, in the meantime, if you do have Q&A already, uh, please do not use the chat function, but please use the Q&A function, uh, which you can, when you hover over to the bottom of the screen, you'll be able to uh, see from uh, in the Zoom app. And I know this is also being live streamed to the MIT Club of Northern California Facebook group. So hello everyone who's joining in from there as well. We'll be starting in uh, just a few more minutes. All right, well, we'll get started as people continue to trickle in. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining for the second session of COVID-19 Frontline Communities Call of Duty, where we bring together alums from different areas of life that are outside of the healthcare sector who are contributing to uh, different COVID-19 efforts. Um, and hello to everyone on the live stream as well. For those of you who are joining on Zoom, you'll hear me say this um, again a few times, uh, but if you do have uh, different questions uh, for the panelists, please enter them in on the Q&A button in the Zoom. And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, please do not use the chat because I probably wouldn't be monitoring that. My name is Wendy Dong and I'm the chair for the Engaged Philanthropy uh, group for the MIT Club of Northern California. Uh, and today you'll be hearing from four panelists from different parts of the world uh, who are working on COVID-19 relief efforts. And so um, we have uh, Hong, who's from the class of 11, courses six and 14, who's joining us from Singapore, very late this time. Uh, we got Lisa, who is a class of 11 from Sloan, uh, who is currently in New York City. Um, then we got Jeff, who is class of 13, uh, course four in uh, SF. And then we also have Mei Li from the class of 99, who is course six, um, and also class of uh, 2000 for Ament in course six, um, who is dialing in from Bogota. So we'll let them get started soon, but just to uh, give you a quick background, thank you for all those of you joining us from outside of MIT Club of Northern California. For those of you who don't know, uh, MIT Club of Northern California is 
uh, and alumni group, um, and you know we have over 10,000 members. We have lots of different events that are happening. Uh, and so if you go onto mitcmc.org, you'll be able to see the upcoming events. Uh, and during this time when all of our events are virtual, uh, we actually made the events um, uh, available to all alums around the world and to the general population. Uh, but if you are an MIT alum who is from a different club, uh, please ask your club leads as uh, they'll have discount codes for you for joining future sessions. Uh, and for those of you from the Club of Northern California, welcome again, and uh, thank you for joining us. So without further ado, I'd love to have the panelists introduce themselves, starting with Hong. All right. Thanks, Wendy. Um, hey, everyone. So my name is Hong. Uh, I graduated uh, 6 and 14 in 2011. Um, and I worked at Google for a couple of years, but uh, and since then, I've been back in Singapore for the last six years working in the government. Um, basically, what we do is uh, we, we're, I'm part of a, how would you describe this, like we're a sort of in-house development team within the government. Uh, and what we are, and what we are set up to do is basically we're, a, we're, a tech te we're trying to be a tech company within government so that it helps government do digital transformation better because traditionally governments aren't very good with technology. And so the idea is to take some of my experience, work in the private sector and other people as well, um, and setting up something similar within government. And so we are about 40 people right now. And in normal times, we go around uh, essentially uh, building uh, building tech products that we think the government should have and should like should help the government work better. So we like figure out like inefficiency. So we have a Google Forms for the government. Um, we've like helped bring a lot of government websites out of like instead of using sort of old like crappy technology which like always crashes and doesn't work well. We have created like a standard GitHub Pages template. Um, we've created a standard GitHub Pages template that uh, that sort of any government website can use that works well and looks and and looks nice. Um, and so now during COVID, COVID times, uh, we basically go around trying to build whatever tools the government needs. Um, so there's a whole bunch of teams around the government doing all kinds of similar things. Um, but stuff that we've built so far, um, we, we built, a, we put together a, a website for the, to, call, to recruit volunteers for the healthcare call. So basically the Singapore government, um, there's a public healthcare system and we basically put up a call for volunteers for, people, for private sector healthcare, formal healthcare professionals to be part of sort of this like, you know, auxiliary healthcare force. Um, we put together another, we, we put together a messaging service, a mass messaging service for the government to like quickly push out information to people. Uh, we, we call it Postman. Basically, it's a very simple web uh, sort of like system where any government officer can just like, if they have a list of phone numbers they need to send messages out to, um, whether it being a local community or like for, whole, for the whole country, um, they have that system. Um, and then we have other systems like, for example, to track like social distancing and like for people to check into places that make contact tracing better and stuff like that. Um, there's quite a lot of different products that we work on, so I won't take up too much time going over all of them, but like, yeah, I'm happy to talk about all the stuff that we're doing. Thank you, Hong. Uh, Lisa, would you like to talk about your product and also your background? Hi, uh, everyone. My name is Lisa. I'm based in New York City. Um, so uh, as Wendy mentioned, I'm class 2011 from Sloan. So my background um, is in business, originally consulting, and then since Sloan is a combination of strategy and analytics and marketing as well in both like large uh, corporations and most recently kind of smaller startups here in New York. Uh, but my involvement with uh, like kind of COVID relief has not much to do directly, you know, it's not part of my job. Uh, but basically what happened is that I, um, my brother is a doctor in a, in a hospital in New York and a lot of my close friends are doctors in hospitals, both in New York and across the country. And so pretty early on, I kind of started looking at what uh, was going on, what they need. And uh, the initiative that I eventually got involved in is uh, provides, me it's called Meals for Heroes. It's an initiative of nonprofit called Doing for Others. It's based in New York and we're providing meals to hospital workers. So not just <clears throat> doctors, but also nurses, EMTs, uh, basically everybody who works in the hospitals, primarily in ER and ICU and medical floors. Uh, and it's a dual mission. So we provide uh, food from a local restaurants. So we also help helping a certain number of local restaurants in New York to stay afloat. Uh, we all know that, you know, with the uh, isolation, a lot of local restaurants, you know, having a hard time. So we wanted to um, help them out as well. And then so far uh, we've been 
able to partner with 10 hospitals in New York uh, out of, I believe, 40 or 50 that there are. Uh, we've delivered around 8,000 meals uh, from 16 restaurants. Um, yeah, and then my, my focus, I was kind of like leveraging not so much like what I usually do at work, but more like kind of like my connections uh, from business school and otherwise, and I've been doing uh, fundraising. Thank you, Lisa. Jeff. Hey guys, my name is Jeff. Um, I studied, started off my career in architecture, made my way through startups, uh, cons design consultancies, research labs, um, to where I am now a designer at Autodesk working on uh, construction software solutions. So focus a lot of my time on design and development in the digital uh, space. Um, my co-organizer and I saw a really big gap in how people are gathering information around COVID. Um, for a lot of people, like your friends and family, a lot of the information is disparate and, and dispersed through different channels, whether it's the WHO or other national government agencies or Twitter channels or your Facebook social media or God forbid, like social media from your relatives on WhatsApp or WeChat or anything you know those places. So a lot of the information is fragmented. A lot of the information is not necessarily true. Um, and not a lot of the information is not actually actionable or helpful for what you need to do to make decisions about your daily life. So what we saw was an opportunity to develop essentially a local news aggregator, an aggregator that provides local up-to-date and actionable information about your city and gives you information about what changes that are happening, whether it's things like grocery lines, whether it's uh, park closings, hours, availability of testing centers, these kind of very actionable things that allow you to be, uh, take action on what you should be able to do within this current situation. Um, so what we've built is something that we call COVID Wire, and it's essentially a news aggregator where about 16 plus um, volunteers from across the country, from engineering, journalism, editorial, um, and all sorts of backgrounds to basically build this site. We're currently moving towards a beta release and we're gonna be in a couple of weeks launching our MVP in a few select cities. Um, and I can talk about that more. Thank you, Jeff. And last but not least, we've got May Lee. I think you might still be on mute. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. It's gonna be, sorry, I'm, I, I tend to be pretty visual, but it's gonna, I'll just hop through this. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Mimi. I'm from a lot of different places right now, living in Colombia. These are all the places that I'm from. Um, I've worked all, all over the place, bounced around a lot between design and engineering over the years. Um, and at the same time was also dancing and DJing, which are two other things that I do a lot of. Um, job wise, I worked at Apple for a while, worked on the first web apps when the first iPhone came out, lots of different devices, new human input, like what does a click feel like, uh, Apple pencil stuff. And then most recently I was at Khan Academy uh, where I kickstarted kind of a, a, a new R&D group over there. We were looking at new ways of using digital media for learning, um, built up the design team to almost 20 people and establish a design system and creative direction and a new brand. Um, I do a lot of other stuff too, like thinking about the future of computation <laughs> and dynamic land. Um, these are some little shots from that. Um, having started a DJ coalition and hosting a lot of cultural events, which we can't do anymore, but that's a thing, and working covertly on a video game for Playdate. Um, most relevant to what's happening right now is Scribble Together. This is a side project that I started a couple of years ago, but it's seen a tick up. It's a collaborative whiteboard, um, just high quality inking and fast to get started up, super simple. Um, app and it's been really nice to see all the people that we've been supporting through this time that can no longer work together but need to be visual. Even we've had couples write in and say like we feel closer <laughs> because we draw together in this app so that's cool. Um, you know we've got we've gotten written in from math tutors and uh, I think the thing that's been most surprising is art teachers as well. Um, this is by an art teacher in Leeds in the UK. Um, we made a special code just so that people can make sure that they have it for free. And, you know, if any of you know volunteer tutor organizations we can donate to, that would be great. Just feel free to reach out. Um, another project that I've worked on uh, with Lindy, Linda Dong and Jesse Char, this was originally Jesse's idea and she got Linda and I in it, just realizing that um, people need to eat from home um, and a lot of discrimination was happening against um, Chinatowns and Chinese food places and uh, people need to feel helpful. So we connected those three needs and created SF Chinese food uh, that just lets you see which order, what to order, um, what's available while you're sheltering in place in San Francisco. 
Uh, we've gotten a lot of requests, uh, keeps on getting plenty of hits every day. Um, so people are requesting new things, um, new cities. And if, if you are passionate and knowledgeable about Chinese food in any of these places, please reach out. Um, and also if you want to help us cover server costs, we have a little buy me coffee. That's it. Thank you so much. And as all of you can see, we have a very wide variety of uh, different things that our alums are doing. You also heard that from our first um, uh, first uh, session on uh, community policy of duty. Uh, and so the question I always like to ask all of our panelists is, you know, of all the projects that you could be doing, how did you decide on your specific project? Because we have lots of alums who are trying to figure out, okay, how do we contribute back? We want to contribute. Um, and unless they're already in healthcare, um, you know, there's some of them are just scratching their heads. So what is your story of finding these particular projects that um, you decided to work on? And let's just go in the same order again, starting with Hong. Also, uh, yeah. just, just before everyone goes, so for those of you who um, joined in a little bit later, uh, please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen to uh, send any questions over and I'll be able to surface those. Yeah, um, in terms of how to how we chose projects, um, well, it turns out there's a lot of stuff to get done. <laughs> um, so it's it, it's I don't think the question really is uh, what needs to get done because every country in the world, I think, in and every community has realized that they were like just woefully unprepared for this the order of magnitude of what needs to get done. So yeah, there, there's like the way I think about this that there are a few separate categories of things that need to be handled. Like the first and most important thing obviously is keeping people alive. So that's on the medical side of things, how to treat like researching vaccines, getting PPE to doctors, things like that. Um, that's like that's like first and foremost. Like um, after that is stopping the spread. So apart from keeping people alive, there's all the stuff around like contact tracing, social distancing, um, all those mechanisms uh, and like, you know, various ways of like, see, you know, seeing who's been where, various ways of like keeping, helping people stay apart, various ways of helping people work from home. Um, that's the second like big chunk of work. Third from there, um, and like, still very important with, uh, is uh, actually a lot of stuff around uh, public communication. Um, one of the things that we found, at least from the government, is that like, despite this being a you know, sort of world crisis, there is a lot of like fake news and scams and like scammers going around trying to exploit this, uh, trying to sell people, trying to sell garbage, people trying to like spread fear and doing all this kind of stuff. Um, and so figuring out how to make sure people feel like that, that the government's communicating with them, making sure they know what's going on, making sure they feel connected to community. Um, and even just socially, just like making sure they don't just get like super depressed and like, you know, just miserable at home. Um, and then finally, there's a last chunk of work, which is like, which is sort of aspirational right now, but uh, it's figuring out how we get back to some kind of new normal. Um, the big, the big thing that people that, that, that people need to, that, that we need to talk about regarding uh, the COVID situation is that this is not a one to two month disaster. This is not like a thing that happens one to two months, we all lock down and then we go back and like, you know, by December, we're talking about how weird that was. This is something that's going to go on for, by most estimates, a year to two years, um, which means that for any sort of, you can lock down in the short run because you really don't have any other option, but in order to sort of not have the entire world economy die, um, you need to figure out some mechanisms by which people can start getting back to work, even in a sort of new normal, like slightly constrained, slightly social distance sort of manner. And so these are like the different dimensions uh, which we think about it. Um, really just the, the, the short answer to like how to choose a project is like whatever you're good at and whatever you're closest to. Um, there are, I, I can guarantee you that whatever you think that the government has or whatever you think the hospitals have and like, yeah, they probably have that. The answer is probably they don't. Um, they probably don't have a good messaging systems. They probably don't have a good system for managing like shift allocation, probably don't have a good system for keeping social distancing. And like, there's a ton of stuff that's not happening. The, the, so uh, two thing, the two, I guess, limiting factors, I guess, for me and the way we choose our projects is like, what do we have ready to go? Like I have an app that was like basically for checking into places, right? Like, and all right, that's great for social distancing. Yeah. I have an app for messaging. All right. That's who's good for this place. There's something somewhere. And, uh, then the second dimension is more just, I suppose, uh, where is a good place to plug into? Because I guarantee you that like every single uh, sort of community leader or like hospital, head of hospital is doing whatever they can and their head is just overloaded with too many things to handle. And so if you have a nice simple place that you can plug in and do some work and like help out, that's probably the best place to start. So I wouldn't fuss about like what the most impactful thing is. 
um, I would just sort of see like there's a lot of stuff to do, find a place to plug in and start going from there. Um, yeah. Thank you. Lisa. Yeah, I mean, I guess there is a, to answer your question, there is like some more general things like observations and more some specifics to each of us, again, specifically my own experience. Um, I think like in a more general ways, um, I think we right now at a moment, you know, one in a hundred years or that, like hopefully, <laughs> uh, where uh, like, yeah, like everybody has an opportunity to contribute if they want to, because the needs like to like, you know, are huge. And, uh, and normally where like the government steps in or a big business steps in, it's like all this, like you can see, like everything is kind of like in a way falling apart, like the established, uh, established ways of doing things, business and otherwise, right? So just see what kind of like, try to identify like, you know, what are the big things, but, and when maybe like where your background fits in, but even if it doesn't, and if it's just close to your heart, just do it. You can start with small things and then, you know, you'll see maybe it goes like into something bigger, um, really. And, uh, and then do it like, you know, if you like, have a really little bandwidth and you have kids and whatnot, and you can do like one hour a day remotely, do that. If you can, you know, can do more, do more and then, or like, you know, uh, like me specifically, I, uh, um, so as I mentioned, my brother is a doctor in, in New York in the Brooklyn uh, Hospital, and uh, close of my, a lot of my friends are. So uh, while um, I originally actually was lo looking at a variety of things to do, but then like situation with hospitals, with PPE, with doctors was the closest to my heart. Uh, and it was a huge, and this continues to be a huge disaster in the U.S. completely, you know, in terms of our government response. Um, and so I was, I, I both saw the need and I was actually quite angry at what's going on because of the kind of how it affected uh, my family and my friends. And so, and then I kind of did that, like the way you do, like in a way a startup, I identified pain points by talking to my brother, I kind of valid, I identified four. Uh, I validated them by talking to other friends who are doctors and actually like I have plans for hospital uh, administrators so I talked to them as well I was like oh yeah and that actually turned out that all four of them and it was like a month ago so it was like all early stage for everyone and they're like hey yeah all four of them is an issue and then I was like okay let me just kind of like see where I can actually do something quick or like, isn't like you know not gonna take me two months to like start and, and then it turned out actually, and like now I see all four of them were indeed an issue and, and luckily were addressed by other people as well. And then I found one where I thought I could do something quicker, found like like-minded people and just started doing that. And uh, that was like, you know, and now we kind of grew rel like, you know, medium size and some like, you know, there's similar initiatives, they grew like, you know, 10 times as bigger than us. Um, but yeah, like you just start with something that you can do, you do what you need. Um, I'm doing fundraising, never done that before, but you know, <laughs> learning on the job. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I think this goes over to just thinking about where are the gaps in our systems right now. Um, I like thinking a lot about systems and if you think about information as its own sort of supply chain, the kind of misinformation, the fake news that's happening. We see a lot of broken prob uh, spaces in there and then those are ripe for improving the solutions to that. Um, I'm actually just gonna quickly share a little di a diagram. Um, and so this is sort of like a, an illustration of how we think about things in systems. So we think about the information that we're gathering uh, from local news, public health agencies, governance, um, both municipal to national and academic research. And so we think about things that are more fact-based, more announcements, and then thinking about how do we curate it through a mixture of algorithms and human moderation. So uh, sort of the end result kind of looks a little bit more like this. This is like what our end front end news feed is gonna look like. You can scroll through the information, you can see things that are happening locally, and this is all kind of dummy data you can see, so it's all repeated article content. But then you can kind of look at things that are happening hyper locally to you. And so um, to that end, I think it's um, a lot of it is because we're a team of complete volunteers, all of whom are working part time, a few hours a night. Um, some of them have kids, some of them have families, some of them are different parts of the United States and we've never met before. Some of them have different engineering backgrounds, some of them don't have engineering backgrounds like myself, some of them are journalists, some of them are editors. And so it's uh, 
it's a really interesting challenge, I would say, to think about how do you flexibly work with everyone's different skill set and different time, uh, time commitments. Um, we're learning a lot uh, because you've got people who are not getting paid to do this, right? You're getting people who are self-motivated. And so a lot of it is also just thinking about how do we continually keep people motivated and, and, and setting um, a really clear vision and mission for what is our aim to accomplish here. And that aim, again, is to really think about how do we drive home hyper-local information that is like really, really leveraging the work of uh, local journalism and helping that also benefit the local journalism news agencies um, clicking on these articles that will basically take you to these local postings and you can actually then read the, the local content in, high, in more depth. Thanks, Jeff. And I just got a question. Um, I know you said this is in beta and it's launching soon. Uh, what will be the URL of the COVID news aggregator? Yeah, so we're going to be covidwire.news. That's going to be our site. Um, we will also have, and I think there's probably going to be some follow-up email. We'll share out like a link to sign up um, uh, for beta or for MVP, and you can be notified. Um, things that we're also looking for, uh, since we're kind of on that topic, is we're also like looking for, uh, like Lisa, like funding um, to make sure that our server costs are staying going up, and also uh, engineering resources to help us make sure that we've got the NLP, the sort of algorithm like aspects of our backend stuff working and, and stable so we can launch in a few cities and then completely just ramp it up as fast as we can to scale across the United States. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And then we'll get into uh, all the other projects and what they may be looking for too. Um, over to you, Millie. Hi, yeah, uh, just to I repeat the question, I, I think it was like, how do you choose how to contribute, yes. right? Mm -hmm. How did you yeah, choose? Yeah, and, and I, I think, uh, oh, sorry, what was that? How did you choose what you did um, and how did you get started? Got it, got it. Yeah, so as, as far as choosing, um, I think Lisa said it's also, it's also very personal in choosing like what you care about and uh, what's, what you're gonna stay motivated about and, um, and, uh, and what you have the, the bandwidth and the availability to do. I think in my particular case, it just happened to be a perfect intersection of a couple of needs and a couple of areas of passion. I care a lot about um, you know, different, different things we can do to address system, systemic inequalities in general. And so, of course, when there's a surge of racism, that's something that I care about a lot. Um, particular, I should, shouldn't say there's a surge of racism, there's a surge of racism targeted at this particular group, because um, uh, it's been there all along. Um, and, uh, and obviously passionate about food and helping people feel empowered to help other people happen to be a great intersection. I think the other thing about it for us was just that, um, you know, Jesse and Lynn and I are already friends and already talking all the time. So I, I talk a little bit about um, sometimes about this thing called project based friendships, because you'll remember sometimes when you were a kid, you'd go over to somebody else's house and you wouldn't sit around and talk, you would make stuff together. So if you have existing friendships with people who are creative and love making stuff, why not just figure out a project so you can hang out and make stuff. Um, and then you can fulfill your own needs for a social connection, which you're not getting sitting by yourself at home, as well as getting something created together that can help the rest of the world. So I think that's kind of how we wound up landing there. But I wouldn't say that I, in my particular case, I didn't deliberate a whole lot before entering into that. And I think similarly with Scribble Together, um, you know, that was another thing where it was a, a passion, an intersection of passions of um, being a visual thinker and wanting people to be able to think together, uh, caring a lot about the pedagogy that actually accepts student thought instead of just like thinking of students as empty vessels, thinking of uh, as people who are creators and have their own thoughts. Um, there's just a lot of aspects of that project that, that kept me motivated. Um, and obviously I care a lot about the education space. So it's sort of like an intersection of, of a whole bunch of needs that you see out there and a whole bunch of your own passions. Um, and then that, that's the kind of thing that'll keep you motivated because also, as Jeff said, a lot of people are doing this in their spare time. You're tired, you've had a full day of other stuff. So it's gotta, it's gotta be something that keeps you driven. Yeah, and on that note, uh, since you many of you already brought this up, you know, you are working with many other other volunteers, or you're looking to recruit volunteers. How have you been successful? Or maybe, like, you know, what are some of the challenges of recruiting volunteers? And how did you go about uh, recruiting yours? And anyone can start. Just feel free to uh, to jump in. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, Lisa, you go ahead. 
Uh, okay, so um, so we, we 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 had a call for volunteers uh, for for I'm my team in Singapore. We got quite a lot of people. Our teams were forty people. We had like three hundred people sign up to be volunteers. Um, so it turns out that like actually, especially among like among the right communities, there are a lot of people, um, especially in tech, with, that that just want to do meaningful work, meaningful work. Um, and so, especially, I think during this time, there's a sort of nice, nice uh, coincidence that uh, a lot of people are being displaced. A lot of people in their current jobs not working, not you know, not doing that much anymore. And so, and they want to help. Uh, so, I think getting numbers of volunteers isn't the hard part. Um, the hard part is coordinating volunteers into a useful like structure. Because if you just took like 300 engineers all the way from interns to senior engineers and just toss them in a pile, you just we wouldn't get very much good work out of them. Um, the main thing is that it's sort of like a reverse pyramid where like you have, like there's you, and then from your first yourself, you need to like stack higher and higher so that you have more people to use uh, and more like effective surface area. Um, and so the, the, I think that's the, that's the main uh, constraint at the moment, which is that like there's a ton of people who want to help um, and there's a ton of things we can do, but like the main limit isn't labor, it's management. It's like, how effectively do you know, like have a project where you can be like, yep, this is all mapped out, just go here and do this. Uh, and like, you won't get in people's way. Um, and you can still sort of see like how different organizational technologies help you do that. Um, because you know, if, you're, if you're doing things traditionally, uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of companies, a lot of governments don't run exactly the most efficiently. There's a lot of intermediate like jibber jabber, um, but you need to set up like, you need to set up like telegram groups, you need to set up like mass messaging, you need to keep people informed of what's going on. For us, we, uh, we put together like a simple like Google doc where we could just share with everybody. Uh, was like, yep, these are all the projects and this kind of help we need. And we sort of, uh, and then for my, my sub team leads, I've sort of like go through the, go through the volunteer list, um, crawl through it and then find the ones who you think are like viable and then contact them directly. And so you're, it, it, it's sort of this, uh, it is, 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 this, is this idea that like there are problems and there are people who directly own the problems and you are trying to quickly, um, quickly like shard out as much of the work from them as possible so that they're not the bottleneck and then you go from there. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, yeah for us, um, I mean, we are at the core relatively small group, maybe uh, 10 people and then you know we work with restaurants and whatnot uh and then i think we we kind of just came together i think you know there um we were, it, it was like a month ago and it was all just like starting out i i randomly found them on uh on facebook like i called they called me back and then some other people also reached out and i think like i've seen in other uh, similar efforts that's basically what's been happening and then the question is whether you're like a smaller team or a larger team um just then to hong's point the question is how do you organize right and how do you establish like channel communications and ownership of what um so, you know, that's like, you, it depends on your project, you'd really need to think, um, like it helps to have a diverse skill sets. Like, you know, for example, like we happen to have like people who are like pretty good on the you know, engineering side, on the, on the visual side. So our website looks good and we look more presentable. So when I go raise money, like, you know, it's easier to do. But I see like some other efforts of like, you know, the website looks like we're in 2003. <laughs> that's not always like the best. So you can sometimes need to proactively recruit people. Uh, and there it helps to be, um, you know, passionate about your cause and, you know, to, uh, to what May Lee was saying. I actually recruited, you know, you can say like several of my friends. Like I knew like, you know, a friend who's a designer and then uh, I reached out to her. I knew somebody, again, I, I think I've been working on the like five, maybe five or six friends that I, I knew for 20 years, I never worked with them before in any capacity. And now like I just brought them on and like, I'm doing like, for example, an art fundraiser, you know, with like one of them for the cause. Um, so yeah, that helps. But the other thing that's important, uh, I think in this particular time and the, the way it's been um, going on at least for the last couple of months, it's like every day and we know it from our personal experience every day is a new day and we, there's no way to plan really like something else is going on and so the flexibility they're like you know in your you know kind of reaction to things and what do you do and how you do it who you work with is very important so kind of like this combination of clear communication management and flexibility 
um, it, you know, it really helps. And then like people will come, like, you know, it's not hard to find people right now. Everybody wants to help, I think. Um, I can add to that too. I, I, I think um, finding volunteers, it was an, a huge challenge. I, we, so my, my co-organizer and I were both designers, so we don't have a journalism background, we don't have engineering backgrounds, and we saw that there was a gap in what we needed to fill in. Um, there's a site called helpwithcovid.com that was started by, I think, Sam Altman um, of YC, and the, it's basically like a community project site where people can post projects that need volunteers, and if it's compelling enough, people can volunteer. And we ended up posting that when they, they first launched the site. A few days went by and we, we didn't think we'd get maybe one or two volunteers. We ended up getting like something like, we're now at 180 people reached out uh, as volunteers. And so obviously you don't want to open the floodgates as Hong Yi says, is like, you don't want to have 180 people. So we have to kind of pick and choose, find the right engineer who can then help us scroll through and find the other engineers that need to be backfill. So we found an engineer who realized that it's like, is a generalist enough that they can speak to the front and back end and some a little bit of the NLP algorithm that we need. Um, we had um, a few journalists reach out. We had essentially uh, someone who's the former editor of Apple News reach out. And uh, so that person's on board and they've kind of helped set up a status for how do we do the moderation from the human curation side? What is the criteria working with, our, with my co-organizer? Co and so we kind of leverage everyone's skill set. Um, the challenge again though is then the management side, right? So the management of how do you coordinate all these different individuals? Um, so we put in these sort of daily Slack channels, everyone does text stand-ups on Slack. We've gotten a lot of free products from Notion, from Figma, from um, all these companies that are offering free premium tiers of their product to then help us leverage collaboration tools remotely better. And we've just reached out, we've asked for the, the, the free resources. So that's been great. Um, but then there's also just like, what is the time commitment? And so like, if you're a lead on one of these projects or a sub, sub task that we have, we ask that the leads also contribute more time. And so that's the challenge is everyone wants to contribute, but everyone maybe only has a couple of hours. And then we also need to find that one person that's able to contribute a lot of time with management experience and overseeing operations. And those are, I think, actually the challenging ones to find. Um, and we're still trying to kind of find that right balance. And that's something that we hope to, to really kind of tackle as we kind of scale up and, and launch. And, and by the way, what is the website again? Because I'm sure some of the attendees uh, and the live stream viewers might be interested in that website that you mentioned. Yeah, shall I post it on the chat channel? Uh, sure, but although the live stream folks won't be able to see that. Oh, I see, um, I see. Yeah, it would be COVID wire, like newswire, covidwire.news. Um, oh, sorry, I meant the um, also the other link that you mentioned where you were able to find. Oh, yeah, it would be helpwithcovid.com. Thank you. Yeah, side note, if, if there's some way of just sharing a whole bunch of links as a follow up to this in some way, that would be. Yeah, so we'll, we'll send that information uh, out. Um, and who knows, maybe Serena will do a blog post uh, and capture all the links once again to the broader community too. Awesome. But yes, all the attendees will, will send out follow-up links for um, all of these um, initiatives that are happening, so you can also take a look. Cool, cool. I think May, uh, May Lee, how um, were you able to recruit your volunteers? So I was actually a volunteer that was recruited uh, similarly to what, what Lisa was describing, that uh, you know people who were friends had something in mind and thought, hey, you know, I, I, we could use another person who knows both about Chinese food and design. Uh, <laughs> in that particular case, um, I think past projects have already been, um, we're already on the way. We have somebody who's come to us for Scribble Together that's interested in helping. And I mean, per the management overhead that both Hung and Jeff were re referring to, it, it um, and, and having worked at a nonprofit in the past, I think it, the, the challenge of coordinating people, like a lot of well-intentioned people, is it's, it's real. Um, and so I, I think if, if you're working with people that you don't already know yet, what we've done is just like vetted stuff and set expectations up front so that it, it's just like recruiting, except it's recruiting volunteers, just applying all that same rigor that you would put into hiring somebody onto your team, but doing it with with people that you're that you're planning to work with and so every time that i've you know i'm starting to work with some other people um to help out and i think 
where I've consciously done that and said, hey, you know, um, here's how, how we kind of want things to go. And like, if anything comes up or is uncomfortable, please, you know, we'll create the space for those conversations or whatever. You know, that's actually been really helpful. And then the times that I haven't done that, sometimes you just wind up in a pile of apologies where everybody's like, I'm so sorry, I haven't been able to, you know, there's a lot of that going on behind the scenes that, you know, we haven't said out loud yet, but that, that's also the reality of it. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I have a, a, more to add on that one. I want to add one more thing. Um, so, I mean, one, well, I guess two, like one quick thing that I think I've noticed, um, like in terms of like management and whatnot, everybody's a volunteer. I still, uh, with that, I think it's important to like, uh, I think to what, uh, like Jeff was saying, like, uh, to establish like a, a more like, like expectations very clearly on both ends uh, of what like because otherwise I was like yeah none of us are being paid you know and therefore like what like you know you can't just keep promising I'm gonna do it not do it then just say like or you can like sign up or and then realize that it's not for you or your circumstances change it's also like it's a health uh, pandemic right so anybody god forbid can get sick so just like very clearly on both and communicated and I think from an organizer side not to be afraid to have some demands right even if people are volunteering because otherwise nothing will happen because i've seen that and then the other thing i think just like in terms of like finding opportunities or um kind of formalized i mean i think what's been going i mean and i can speak only on the us and our timeline so it's been going on really for like a month a month and a half right and what all of us kind of like started something was started you know now it's things are changing right uh it's 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 been it's been a sprint but really we're talking about to like hong's point it's going to be a marathon right so a lot of these organizations that are starting uh some of them had like you know us for example we have like a pretty short-term goal in mind and then with specific organization or a group i'm in maybe we'll end at short-term goals but i'm talking uh just conversations with similar like maybe somewhat larger organization there say okay now we have 600 people and we're present and 40 cities in the U.S. We even if like the immediate peak in the U.S. passes and we don't need to feed doctors like what else can we do with this group of people right so and then like you know like this starts also to formalize like your organization and also formalize what your needs are, right? So now like, you know, they have like, okay, you have to like explain how you can contribute, right? It almost like becomes like a job interview in some way, right? So you also kind of have to think both again from expectations on both ends, like as organizations kind of like have a more clarity of where are they going through in this like maybe 12 to 8, 12, know, 24 months time frame where do you fit in and it's kind of hard to know per se in both ends but it's important conversations and thinking to do because like i feel people like emotionally really tired of this already and then i think like a lot of people who really want to contribute are just gonna like i'm done like <laughs> i want this to be over like on, in every way <laughs> so that's just something to keep in mind I, I, I wonder, can I add to that? Um, which is, I, th I think there is this sort of fatigue that I've seen with the initial sprint of a lot of volunteers. And then sort of now this is a bit of a trap of sorrow because you got people who have been working on it for about a month or so. And now there's sort of this motivational factor of like, well, are we going to push something out in the near term? And also what is the long-term vision? So there's a mix of having to sell a long-term vision of saying, you know, this sort of type of thing that we're developing for a news aggregator is not just applicable to this one pandemic, but any sort of disaster response or any relief efforts and thinking about like, we start to think about a long-term vision of if this is um, like Doctors Without Borders is a first responder, like what is the first responder for news and information? Like we kind of have to think about that. So there's like this interesting gap we've got with like people who want to do a sprint and cycle and, and kind of get something out immediately. And also saying that because this is a marathon, you also need people to sort of switch their mental models of being able to think about pacing themselves and not burning out over a longer period of time. I think the one, one thing I would add to all of that is, um, and just having worked in nonprofit slash with volunteers before is, is getting your decision-making process clarified upfront is really, it can save you a lot of pain further on down the line, which is, you know, just from the start being like, hey, you know, we all super appreciate everybody's willing to help out. There's going to be moments where somebody just needs to make a call and that's going to be whoever the person is. 
um, just so that, you know, there's not a bunch of sore feelings where people are like, well, I gave my time and I wanted it to happen this way, you know, like stuff like that will inevitably come up. So just being clear from the start will save a lot of, a lot of mud later. And, and since we are on the topic of volunteers, what are some of the key challenges you're seeing now in the, in the volunteering positions that you're looking for that alums can help with? Or in, in just the ge general population as well? Challenges in terms of what? You're, the challenges that you're trying to solve for right now that you're recruiting volunteers for. Yeah, um, so, all right, me, go ahead. I'll start on the lightest note. Um, people who are qualified and passionate about eating Chinese food takeout in <laughs> Manhattan and Brooklyn where I can't test the food right now. Um, and I think we, we've got probably more people in Oakland. So that's one thing we're looking for. And then, um, yeah, that's, I would say that's the main thing. But like, I, like I mentioned earlier, if people know volunteer tutoring um, groups or clubs or organizations that are, would need the collaborative whiteboarding to also just let us know so that we can make sure people can get it for free. Um, on my side, I need devs. Like I, I need as many devs as I, as I can get basically. Uh, if the way to think about it is that, um, well, very specifically, I, I need uh, experienced edge managers who can help me manage devs as well. Um, the there are a lot of things that we want to try doing. Um, and the problem is that nobody knows exactly what the right solutions are to this. Like, do you track by Bluetooth? Do you track by Wi-Fi? Do you contact trace like using check-ins? Do you contact trace using phone numbers? Do you contact trace? Like there's a whole bunch of different things that we're trying to do. Um, and so uh, our car, like the, the approach to this isn't about like picking one or two things and just doing that. The approach that we're taking in the government is that like what we're hoping to take is just build all the demos and all the things and try them out in a dozen different places and whichever ones work, we can take those forward. Um, and so if I had more volunteers and more people, uh, well, more importantly, like edge management to help me manage more volunteers, um, then we could try more ideas. Um, and a, a lot of them will be crap. Like a lot of things will just, well, yep, we tried that app. It doesn't work out. We tried that approach that doesn't work out. And that's okay because no, like all this is new, basically. Um, everything, every response that every country is doing, no one's ever done this before in the history of the world. And so it's a, it's a, it's a sort of like scientific experimental process where you need to very rapidly try to get ahead of this. Um, so, yeah. And do you, are you just looking for, just to confirm, because you are talking about Singapore, are you just looking for volunteers in Singapore? Or um, no, actually, we're, we're happy to have volunteers. Like, I mean, we're all working remotely now anyway. So, I mean, this is now, it's like, it's like 3.50 Singapore time. So I'm quite happy to be up like whenever and, and, and chat with people whenever. Uh, the team is fairly asynchronous in how we operate. So if people want to help out and you're interested, like, I'm talking with a bunch, like we are, we are looking at working with a bunch of uh, different American groups as well, because my understanding is that like, uh, the Singapore government is a more like as a faster way to get something deployed. Uh, not always, but sometimes. Um, and so if we, we, are, we're like, we are looking for solutions and if people have something ready to go, we're happy to test them uh, if, even if the, uh, the local or state governments aren't ready yet. Um, I'll add to echo Hongyi because we're basically looking for devs and eng managers as well because uh, we need eng managers who can also help make decisions and we're finding a lot of challenges when we talk about how do you find and determine what is local information you know, there's a lot of different ways of geospatially breaking down a locality. And that architecture is the fundamental aspect of how this news aggregator happens. And we have a lot of engineers with different ideas and different algorithms and things they want to try. And that's a big challenge for us is how do you actually get consensus? And so we have people who are helping us to develop that consensus, but engine managers who can manage this that time. And also, you know, we also need to help motivate people and also the people who are spending a few hours here and there Alignment is, is, is a huge aspect of it. Outside of that, I would say we've got like need for people who want to be able to just be human moderators and click and we have a criteria list and like if you want to be able to help us like this article is not helpful, this article is helpful. And if you don't want to contribute your time in this particular project, like there's always a benefit of just calling out misinformation, calling out sensational articles as you see it on social media with your friends and family and like just helping to hammer and, and filter out that content is super important, regardless of whether it's on a site or within your own networks. I mean, for us, it's like, I don't, I don't know if we're necessarily looking for 
someone very actively uh, um but you know obviously we're looking for you know continuing to do fundraising continuing to spreading the word um so things like that and then i mean i think it's like for us it's a bit of a question mark right now uh how do we go beyond like say mid to end of may timeline like you know as we really get the end of this specific need in in new york um like so yeah for us so like individually and together is to figure out and see like you know where do we want to continue contributing i'm going to throw a random question in there what are some of the surprise learnings that you've had throughout building this uh, your project for uh, COVID-19 or projects for many of you I, it's it it's a lot harder than than the initial idea <laughs> to execute I would say we, um, in talking to the former editor from the Apple News, he, he mentioned, he's, he said, you know, I had a team of 300 people that I worked with over six years, and I still think Apple News isn't that great. Um, and he's like, so what you guys are doing is, is, is challenging and uh, admirable, which also maybe is, is uh, a, a, a nicer way of saying naive. Um, but I think those kind of, kind of interesting surprises that if you know my my co-organizer and i had realized the challenges so early on we may have never embarked on this path but that's the uh, mit mentality you know you have you just work on the things that are the hardest otherwise you probably get bored of it that's that's exactly it it's still it's still very much drinking out of a fire hose situation these days i think for me it's um how minimum viable minimum viable product can actually mean um, so there's, there's like, there's two things here, right? Like, um, the first one is that you're not like making another food delivery app, right? So if you're building, um, if you're building like, I don't know what, like there's tons of apps, like tons of dating apps, there's tons of food delivery apps and like in normal startup times when you're doing normal startup competition, there's like 20 other people competing with you. Um, the thing you're doing right now is you're filling needs, you're filling gaps, you're filling things that just don't exist. And so, um, you like, yes, you it, it, like, there's a lot of stuff you will do and you'll be like, oh yeah, but we're not doing this properly. And we're not really doing our deployment properly. And like, we haven't really user tested. And like, there's all this stuff you, and if you're doing normal like competition, yeah, that will kill you. But right now, just getting anything out there is better than nothing. Um, like anything. Yeah. And so, and so like, you know, you know, for the people who, for the people who aren't getting fed, food's good. Even if it's not like the most efficient, like smoothest pipeline and the website isn't perfect. Um, and similarly, like for one of our apps, like basically we needed a way of just sort of having people who are on quarantine order just report their, report their temperatures and report their symptoms, right? Because they're on quarantine and what they were doing before was that they were handing out scraps of paper and writing scraps of paper. And this was like for like a thousand people and they would collate their scraps of paper. And like, so even having just some crappy basic website, like where people could just fill this in on their phone and have it automatically in a big, spread, uh, big spreadsheet already helped. Um, so that's, I think, probably on my side, the most surprising thing that like, there is a lot that we don't have and you can really like just minimum viable or minimum viable product already can start filling some gaps and go from there. Totally. Just, sorry, echo on that. Like, I think like what I learned is efficiency doesn't matter. Planning doesn't matter very much. Just do something <laughs> because like the horizon is about three days and then something changes and and like and luckily like you know some of the ideas that you know was specific that we're doing is like other you know there was a real need so like a lot of other people you know organizations picked it up and and on the one hand you kind of want to coordinate to like not like you know say we helping hospitals in new york and you don't want to be in a situation then like you know, some hospitals in Manhattan are being helped by five organizations and nobody's been helped in certain hospitals in Brooklyn, but with the way things changing, it's almost impossible to coordinate. And so just do something, something is better than nothing. And uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you super chill on the tool set. I mean, I think for us, just going from, we just went from Figma to Webflow. And I saw Figma up when Jeff was showing a screen earlier today too, which has been a great tool just to get a whole bunch of stuff up. You've got your visuals up super quickly and then using Webflow to build was like shockingly fast and just setting up a Google spreadsheet so that everybody could just get all their menu information in there. It was a lot of like, what's gonna be fast? We're not gonna you know, do an analysis across six different possible tool sets. Like this might work, let's try it. Oh, cool, it worked. That's kind of like how we, 
<laughs> I think the biggest surprise was that, you know, in, in doing all of that, like you said, just do something, just put something out there, that we did that. And it, I, we were surprised at how much it caught. I mean, we just thought it was like a tiny thing. And, to, and you know, it just a lot of people it apparently just really hit that intersection of needs. So um, I think that was probably the biggest surprise. <laughs> but shout out to both Webflow and Figma. Thank you so much, everyone. I know we're almost on time. Any like last parting words for for the um, alums and, and the participants who are listening in? Yeah, I, I definitely had something I wanted to say, which is that there's a lot of people out there who aren't tech savvy. And a good thing to remember is that just your comfort with any mundane little thing right now is probably super 100 times fold helpful to somebody out there. You know, uh, we've been helping, just helping this group that we were talking about earlier with Conexión Colombia put together a GoFundMe page, helping our musician friends figure out how they can stream. Um, my sister actually put together a volunteer site in Rhode Island to connect tech savvy people with, um, with small businesses that are just really intimidated by getting their accounts up and running. And they, they don't need a whole website. They just need a good Instagram account. Like, you know, just teaching people what quality photography of product looks like, how to set up a what's just all of those like tiny little things and really considering who's, who's vulnerable because um, there are some populations that are much more vulnerable than others. So I think, I think the two things like one, there's a million small ways that you can help that aren't necessarily starting a whole thing. There's a lot of efforts that are already out there that you could help in tiny ways, whether or not it's donating um, money or just teaching somebody how to set up an Instagram account, like stuff like that, <laughs> which button to push, just making sure that people know where the mute unmute button is on all, all of these things like, and, and just comforting people because there's so much anxiety around tech that I think we forget about oftentimes as technology. And those things can just have a huge impact on all the community and the people around you that have less access to technology or less comfort with it. Um, that's my main thing. I would say like just it's I mean it's hard because like we're not really physically allowed to be next to each other too much although we'll see what happens next few months as we kind of loosen that a bit but I think it's a time to be in, in some ways hyper local right so like help your neighbors and like you know maybe next door or otherwise meet them if you haven't met them before like I created a whatsapp group for my building and like in a way about 60 apartments and we never really talked before and now we talk all the time uh and then so yes yeah, like just like there's like a million ways to help and just keep looking for them and just keep like but don't get like mentally settled on anything for potentially too long or or maybe you do but like reevaluate things because needs change so much in a month from now it's going to be different in two months from now it's going to be different so just keep asking yourself where i can what can i do to help is this is the right way and if you want to help you'll find a thousand ways to help um so for my end i think the main thing is uh this like it's it's very it's very tempting, I guess, to look at this as like a tragedy, like, you know, disaster and whatever. Normally that's how we look at things, right? It's hurricane, built, like, you know, explosion, shooting or something, and then people feel sad and you don't. Um, but that's like, we've only just gotten started. This is not a tragedy. This is, this is a world reshaping event. Um, and if we do good here, it turns out we can actually have a lot better world after this. Like we can build tools, we can go and we can make sure that we come out with minimum harm, still a lot of harm, but minimum harm and hopefully like communities come out of this okay. Um, if we do poorly, well, you've seen what happens in countries when things go poorly. Like it's, it's disastrous, right? Like, like um, and, and so this is, this is not a sort of a, a hypothetical. It is not a, it's not a feel good thing. It is, it is not a, uh, it is not one of these sort of, you know, we, we, we donate $2 to the person asking on the street and, you know, sort of hope some abstract way things are better. Like there are, there, there is going to, there are, a ton of structures and tools and mechanisms and, and communities that just need to be put together and built. Um, and there, like, it is not enough of it. Like, the, the, like there is not, the, the, is the, the, the job that needs to be done isn't being done. And so if you think that you could help and it will make a big difference, the answer is yes, like it will. Because I guarantee that even if everybody, uh, everybody you know, starts trying to do, like putting together tools, building communities, teaching people, we will only get a little bit of the way there. Um, and so if you're look like if you're trying to think of like where you can be impactful, the answer is just everywhere. And don't worry too much about that. Just get something started. Yeah, I would say like 
think about in terms of like strategic experimentation, right? We're, we're, we're taught to think about things in systems. We're taught about how to think about how one impact here has ramifications down the line. And as long as you can experiment and try to think about quickly implementing and quickly failing on those, like no one's going to fault you on that and, and, and trying to rally a team behind that to have that kind of shared vision around how you want to experiment solving a particular problem. I think just trying and then testing it out is, is, is at that very least, you're going to be having a lot of learnings on a personal level and hopefully impactful on us on a global scale. Well, thank you all so much for your time and joining in from all over the world, um, <laughs> even the 4 a.m. one. Um, so th thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, it's been very inspirational to me, as I'm sure it's been for the rest of the uh, alums and, and um, participants listening in. Uh, so thank you very much. And we will send out the links for all of the different uh, projects that were discussed here uh, shortly. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for joining me and the virtual applause for our panelists. Thank you. Nice meeting everyone. Yeah. Nice meeting Thanks, everyone. Thanks Rich for the nice comment. Thank you Mahalia too. <laughs>